before i can proceed further and let you know what exactly uh, we are going to uh, go ahead and listen to adrian dusa i would like to uh, go ahead and read a little bit um, of his profile which i have um, downloaded it uh, to be very honest ad from one of uh, your uh, i should say portal itself so if there is something wrong or if you want to add i would really appreciate it otherwise i have got this as the information um adrian dusa as you all can see he is full professor full time professor at the university of bhutan however more than this i would like to say that he is known uh, and i got introduced to him through his our package um along with the same name as qca and while i was learning about that particular package and i started interacting with him i uh, you know came to know about certain other things also with respect to our studio number 1 number 2 about the package itself so he is working in the department of sociology at the university of bucharest teaching social statistics research methodology and measurement in the social sciences apart from that he has a uh, being a uh, national coordinator of the efs that is european social survey and director for roda that is romanian uh, social data archive also side by side and then he has been um, you know archiving i should say the data for over 20 years right now and apart from that i uh, saw that his main interest is in qca and trust me right from the time i got introduced to that particular package i have been um seeing him uh, you know working writing various books also on the same topic and discussing on various platforms exclusively on qca only so i can understand that his interest is solely lied upon in qca the full form of it is qualitative comparative analysis so i'm very lucky um that after uh, requesting him that i would like to uh, go ahead and arrange for a master class and learn from him only about qca uh, he agreed to it and he is the one who suggested uh, the date and timing also so that he is available and we are able to learn about this methodology also side by side so i welcome you for believe uh, adrian and i give to the entire now time to for you to start off the session exclusively on qualitative comparative analysis thank you adrian Thank you very much, uh, Ramani. Thank you uh, all for joining. Uh, this is going to be a presentation about QCA uh, using R. Um, before this session started, I asked Ramani about the composition of the audience. Um, whether you are familiar with R, whether you are familiar with QCA, because. teaching either of them is challenging and to teach uh, qca with r is even more challenging um and i learned that some of you may be familiar with r um qca is probably a very new concept for many of you uh neither of them is necessary right now um you don't need to know r in order to understand what i am doing um i am merely going to use or to demonstrate what i want to show you today but otherwise it will be very easy not only following the video that we are recording right now it's going to be very easy to um come back to these topics and try it on your own um uh by following the examples and not only again uh the video will be staying there but i'm going to base my uh presentation uh also with free online resources like the a book uh which is called qca with our comprehensive resource it's available online you can download it i will i will show it to you in a minute how and then of course uh or or is a um a very well known right uh, well it's kind of let's say new in to the social sciences it's been very established for over 25 years now in other sciences 
but it's now slowly penetrating the social sciences as well. So if the audience is mostly new to R and QCA, at least I assume that the audience is familiar with uh, social sciences. <laughs> Uh, so we, we, let's let's say we are all um, coming from uh, social related uh, scientific domains, and then I am also going to assume that uh, many of you, let's say, are familiar with uh, social science methodology, data analysis, uh, why not even statistics? Um, QCA doesn't have anything to do with statistics, but I am going to use some statistical techniques in, into certain procedures of QCA. Uh, so given that I, I teach statistics at the University of Bucharest, but I am also involved in this other thing, which is called QCA. Now, we all know that um, uh, the research methodology in the social sciences is, let's say, divided between the quantitative and the qualitative approaches right the people who are analyzing data using statistical techniques and the people who are using purely qualitative um, uh, research techniques like the interview like the in-depth focus groups and so on and so forth um, uh, text analysis uh, images and so on those are very qualitative approaches now qca has nothing to do with statistics um, it's, it's a qualitative technique, let's say, because the cue from QCA comes from qualitative comparative analysis. But it's, it's not the kind of qualitative analysis that we are familiar, like the interviews and analysis of groups and so on and so forth. It's a qualitative analysis, but um, it, we are qualitatively analyzing cases using a uh, Boolean minimization algorithm that we are developing in the uh, computer. And then we feed the data, that part, the kind of qualitative data that we have. We, it is now possible to feed qualitative data to the computer, and then the computer will give us a solution, right? So this is, uh, this is where QCA is positioned, right? Between the qualitative and the quantitative approaches. It's, it's a qualitative approach, but it's using uh, computer algorithms, let's say, okay? Um, so let me uh, share my screen first. I am, uh, I am not going to use uh, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm, uh, let's say, uh, I find that very boring. Uh, I am actually going to be very interactive. And um, uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that I always like to do, let's say, interactively, right? It should not be a monologue from me to you guys, because um, uh, this is what the people uh, seeing the registration of this video, they will see a monologue. But with you guys to uh, do this thing live with me, it would be better to do this interactively. So feel free to interrupt me any, any, any time you want. If you want more details, if you want uh, some more in-depth um, uh, explanations for the concept that I'm going to present. In any case, I'm, um, let's say I would like to um, uh, organize my presentation, let's say in six small sections. And I will roughly allocate like 10, 15 minutes for each um uh, in order to allow some more uh, time at the end of this uh, webinar for the q a session questions and answers right um so this is an interface uh, uh that is dedicated to the r uh, data analysis software right it's something similar let's say well it, it's not similar but it's doing the same kind of thing with the other established data analysis software for the social sciences, assuming you know what SPSS is or Stata or whatever software you're using for uh, analyzing data in the social sciences. So R is doing uh, the same kind of uh, purpose, analyze data statistically, but it, it has a very, very different interface. Uh, as you can see here, 
it's mostly about typing commands, running the commands, and seeing the output. Um, so once you've installed R, and um, I'm going to go here, and if you Google R, just capital letter R, the first link that you will see is the R project for statistical computing, and then there's a link for download, and then just choose a mirror, and then go for whatever platform you have, like Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, in my case is Mac OS, and then just uh, download that, or for Windows here, download this, the base, and, um, and then install it. And, and the other, after you have installed R, there is this R Studio, which is a, let's say, a, an interface on top of R, which I find very useful, at least for uh, teaching things and, and demonstrating things, because it also, it has the syntax editor, because we are going to type comments, and it also has the R console. It's called the R console because we can type here commands interactively, and R responds, responds with the result of our command here. And the advantage of a script, let's say, of typing a man in a, in, a, in a script is that we can uh, save, the, this is a text file that you can open with any text editor on your computer. And um, uh, this is going to remain there for, for, and, and, and you can look at it uh, later, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate a few concepts about R. Um, and given that we are going to uh, use the QCA package. The QCA is, is based on packages. It, it, has, um, it has a number of base packages that are, is, that are that come predefined with our software. And then there are additional contributed packages like mine. It's, it's called QCA from Quality to Comparative Analysis. And this is, this is the command to install it after uh, installing our, in our studio. Now, um, again, going back to the web page, I told you there is a book like this one here, that's a PDF. It's the book I've published with uh, Springer uh, in 2019. And that is the uh, uh, most recent PDF version of my book because I'm updating it continues. Um, and it's available online on um, both HTML and PDF versions. And it's available on a website called bookdown.org. It's called bookdown.org. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you will have to um, you will have to create a an account on bookdown.org uh, with login, but it's free. You can probably use your Gmail account uh, to sign in, like for instance here, uh, login, and then I can I can use the Google sign in with Google. Um, okay, but otherwise, the complete link is bookdown.org, and this is my nickname, USAVN, and then I have the QCA book, like there. I'm not sure if it's visible, so that's bookdown.org slash DUSAVN slash QCA book slash, and this is the, where you will find the, uh, the most recent version of the book with all its chapters, all its examples and all. So it, it's free, it's online, it's there for you to use. I'm probably not going to make you QCA experts in one and a half hours, but what I can guarantee you is that after this webinar, many of you will be sufficiently intrigued about this methodology, about this technique, in order to try it on perhaps in your own research. Now here in this web page, you see a, a top menu like here with a button to download. And you can download the PDF, which, which you see here, right? Or the EPUB version that you can uh, uh, read on your Kindles or whatever tablets you have, right? So this is where you will find the book. So I, we will scroll through the book and you can always find it online for future reference, right? And this is how the book is structured. Again, our basics and, and then some information about the package itself. 
Uh, we are going to talk about set theory, calibration also is a very important topic. And then we are going to analyze in set relations, we are going to analyze necessity and sufficiency. We are going to look in the truth table procedure and, and see how we are going to perform the minimization that is what is the QCA package for and, and see the, the, the solution. So what is it? actually before going into into the uh, our concept what is it about qca that attracts so much attention I've, I've held webinars in in various parts of the world in the us in europe even in china and it's it's a great pleasure now to uh, popularize this technique in india and other parts of the world as well now what is it that attracts people about qca so in statistical analysis, uh, uh, if you are familiar, let's say with the analysis of regression, right? In, in regression, uh, we have, let's say, causes, cause one, cause three, oops, here, and then we have an effect. So that those are independent variables, and this is the dependent variable, and each cause, each independent variable has an effect on the dependent variable. And there are uh, quantified measures about how uh, large is the effect of each cause on the, uh, on, on the dependent variable here. And, and usually in statistical language, usually we say, well, this is how much the effect will change when the cause one changes with one unit uh, and this is this is the the average effect on the dependent variable there and, and this is the usual language in quantitative analysis now on the other hand uh, the famous uh, um, uh, a famous sociologist once visited the university of bucharest uh, it's um, uh, and he he said something that that remained with me for a very long time he said well uh if if we are talking for instance about welfare which countries demonstrate welfare and he said well welfare is a function of education and health and uh, that is Actually, this kind of this kind of proposition has nothing to do with statistics. If you look, um, it's valid at both individual level. Like educated people, usually make more money, let's say, and are better off than uh, people with less education. And also, you have to be healthy, right? Because poor uh, people and uh, uh, people with um, uh, several illnesses they cannot make as much money as very highly educated and healthy people right so this is valid at individual level for sure but it's also valid at, at, at country level countries with an average education the higher average education usually have a higher uh, average welfare and also countries with uh, health systems that are very well developed they usually have a higher demonstrate a higher welfare. So, uh, of course, welfare is it's a combination of many factors, but probably those two are some of the most important ingredients in uh, producing welfare. And uh, education alone accounts for something in the welfare, uh, but education without health does not work. Uh, uh, and the other, the other way is also valid. Right, so uh, health alone accounts for something in welfare, but health without education does not work as well. Does not work as, uh, as good. Right. So if if you can picture that that in terms of set set theory, right. So let's say if you if you are familiar with Venn diagrams, right. This is education. That that's let's say this is the universe of all educated people, or the uh, the, the the circle of all uh, countries with a high level of education, right? And 
outside the circle, right? Let's say here, this is uh, all countries which do not demonstrate a high level of education, right? And then we have health. Oops, like here, health. Now, health without education does not produce welfare, and education without health does not produce. What is producing welfare is the combination, the intersection between health. And this is, this is where welfare resides, let's say, at the intersection between education and health. And, uh, and, and a normal language, when, when you uh, demonstrate a concept like that, it, it usually, the, no, layman's language, it usually uh, approaches explanation like this. It's a combination of education and health, right? Um, let's say if you want to explain uh, hard, uh, high grades for the students, it's a combination of intelligence and hard work, right? Intelligence without putting some work will not get you a good grade. And uh, hard work, but if not intelligent, will not get you a good, very good grade. But if you are intelligent and you work hard, then your grades are going to improve. This is a, an example that is very easy to understand by students. For instance. And it's, it's the language is put like that. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, thinking about the uh, social reality and about the social phenomena, it's, it's rather common, and especially in uh, cross-national comparative studies. Because right? usually what we do in statistics is, let's say, take country one, uh, let's say Romania, and then... Uh, 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 sample individuals in that country, right? And take averages of various variables like education, high um, uh, number of years of education or income or whatever uh, variables we have. And then take another country, let's say, well, let, let's say India, right? And take another representative sample from there. And then we have average one, average two. And then we compare the averages, let's say. Um, but, and, and that works as well, right? But in this quantitative analysis, the cases are the individuals, right? We have uh, as, as many cases in Romania as we have sample, right? But in cross-national comparative studies, the cases are not the individuals. The cases are the countries, because we have Romania for once, we have India for once, and any other countries. And we compare, for, for instance, the GDP, the gross domestic products, right? And, and that has a value here for Romania and another value here for India and so on. And we compare aggregated results, right? Like, like for instance, the average is an aggregation of all individuals in Romania here. The average here is an aggregation of all the individuals here. So those are aggregated uh, numbers that we use to compare. And the GDP is also an aggregated measure that describe the countries in certain ways. Now, why are we interested in comparing countries? And there are tons of uh, bibliographical references that are dealing exclusively with uh, cross-national comparative studies. Um, we are, uh, comparing countries, first because this is what sociology is all about. Sociology is, is about comparing. And uh, we compare in the quality of comparative analysis, we compare countries in order to determine which causes, which combination, which minimal combination of causes is responsible with a certain uh, outcome, right? Like for instance, we know uh, we have a certain number of causes coming from our uh, social science hypothesis, right? C3, cause one, cause two, cause three, and we have the outcome as we call it in QCA. And then we have the cases like Romania, India, Bulgaria, and so on and so forth, Switzerland, and so on and so forth. 
And we have some numbers for those cases. And this is where set theory comes handy, right? Um, and by comparing these numbers, we can uh, minimize this kind of data and, and look at the minimal um, uh, solution. Um, and coming back to GDP, uh, let's say, as a measure, uh, we are used to analyze, statistically analyzing gross uh, raw data like that, like the GDP numeric data like that. Um, and if, if we are looking at the GDP per, uh, per capita in many countries, we will see usually reports uh, of amounts in, let's say, US dollars or whatever uh, currency. Um, and the more uh, units per capita a country has, it means that country is developed, right? Like, uh, Another example that comes with our earlier examples, the more years of education an individual has, this is uh, how we uh, 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 compare individuals or the larger the average education in a country compared to another and so on and so forth, and uh, a score for health and, and so on. In QCA, we will not measure the average effect of each cause on the outcome. But we want to determine, let's say, uh, again, coming back to our natural language uh, explanation for social phenomena, right? Uh, welfare is a matter of education and health. Uh, that can be translated in set theory. If a country is a member of educated countries, and if that country is a member of the healthy countries, then we would expect the outcome, which is welfare, to appear, to, uh, to exist, right? So you are either member of a set or you are not a member of that set. And uh, in, our, in, uh, in the online version of the book here, if you look at the set theory, I'm going to put it even larger, larger text. You can see the type of sets we are going to use. Like these are bivalent crisp sets. And uh, that uh, is exactly what I showed you right now. You are either a member of the set, like the set of educated countries. If you are here, you are going to be allocated a value of one. If you are here, you are going to be allocated a value of zero. So these are crit set. They have only two values, zero and one. Those are called crisp sets, and I call them bivalent crisp sets because they have two values, B valent. Right? And then there are multivalent crisp sets. Like think for instance, um, think for instance the traffic lights, right? Like that. Uh, when you when you go to the car, you have red, you have yellow and you have green, right? And they are mutually exclusive, right? Uh, a red, yellow, and green. They are mutually exclusive. So if you are a member of green, uh, let's say you get a value of zero, and then a value of one, and then a value of two. So instead of zero and one, multi-value, the so-called multi-value uh, sets, they have more than one value. In this, more than two values, in this case, three values, zero, one, and two. And you can have three, four, and so on and so forth, depending on how many values you have. But usually they have a, not more than three or four values, right? And, and uh, for, for a very long time, the QCA analysis was, um, uh, uh, was analyzed, and, and this is a, a, the 1987 uh, seminal book of Charles Regan. This is his name. Uh, the seminal book in QCA, which is called the Comparative Method, it was all about crisp sets. So if a country, let's say, has uh, um, one here, it's a member of educated, and it's not a member of uh, healthy, and it's a member of whatever other uh, cause you might have, and let's say the outcome, 
this is the outcome. Okay, and let's say another country here has one, also has zero, and has zero here, right? Um, and looking at this, one represent the cause happens, zero represent the cause is not happening, right? It's absent. This is presence and this is absence. This is the usual uh, language in QCA. Presence is one, absence is zero the binary system right and we see that we have a combination of uh, cause one and three in romania let's say we have only one cause present in bulgaria but in in both cases the outcome happens now it turns out that using boolean uh logic we can actually minimize this because we can we can write this down as um cause one here multiplied with the absence of cause two uh, multiplied with the presence of cause three here and then in Romania and then in Bulgaria we have cause one multiplied with the absence of cause two multiplied with the absence of cause three right and let's let's write them down uh, in a simpler version we have a non b and c plus a non b and non c and we can factor factor things out here right and we have a non b which happens in both cases and then we factor c plus non c now it turns out that c plus non c is equal to the entire universe it's equal to one usually and then is a non b uh, uh, multiplied with one and then the solution is a non b right in all situations where a happens and b doesn't happen then the outcome happens which means the third cause was eliminated as a relevant cause for the outcome and we remain with a minimal number of causes that explains the presence of the outcome in all the cases we are analyzing, right? So QCA is a technique that compares cases in pairs of two. So we, we, we compare all possible pairs of two cases. So in, in this case, let's say we have four countries. We have one pair, two pairs, three pairs, and then uh, four pairs, uh, uh, five pairs, and then six pairs. For, for four cases, we have six possible comparisons. Each comparison uh, eliminates a certain cause. And then from the results, we compare once again all the results that we uh, um, uh, remain with. And then in the end, we have nothing else to compare. And the solution we arrive is the minimal explanation for for the outcome and that's how that's how qca works now that was in 1987 many years after critiques especially from the quantitative analysis looking at this uh, and saying well it's a very crude and very let's say uh, undeveloped technique because for instance, a country is not merely developed or not, let's say, right? Um, a country is not merely uh, a member of educated countries or not, right? You, uh, countries are more or less developed. Uh, and this is where the main critique has arrived. They are more or less developed, like here right and uh, in, in early 2000s charles regan developed the analysis from crisp sets to fuzzy sets and this is how fuzzy set qca came into place uh it's spelled fsqca oops qca and then we are not going to obtain numbers only zero and one but actually obtain a number on a continuum between zero and one. And this is 
uh, what the calibration is all about, and I will demonstrate that earlier, uh, uh, later on. Okay, so this is what QCA is. So instead of instead of zeros and ones here in the in the truth table here, uh, we can actually have zero point uh, two or zero point eight, which is closer to one than to zero, right? And that has another um, type of uh, analysis that I will explain later. Okay, so that's QCA in a nutshell. We are analyzing pairs of cases. We are analyzing pairs of numbers like this that are calibrated from the original data. And then we want to explain in what proportion the outcome comes from which combination of causes. So that's, that's QCA in a nutshell. So returning to R, R is uh, open source is free. It doesn't cost you anything to install it on your computer. And naturally, the QCA package in R is also free for you to uh, for you to install with using this command here. This the command is uh, described in the book. And once you install the computer, you have to open the package by uh, running the command library QCA. And now we will have access to the uh, commands inside the package. So here is R, and R is primarily a statistical analysis software but it's extensible to any type of analysis including qualitative analysis as we can see right so uh r when it opens r is very shortly it's like uh, uh any other program that you open in your memory in the rom memory right and you can create all sorts of objects and sites right um and it also it has a relation with the hard drive, right? It's like opening a word computer. Uh, uh, this is the hard drive like that. Uh, uh, opening a word file and you work on your word file, but you have to save it on the hard drive. Otherwise, when you close Word, you will close you will uh, lose your work, right? So you need to save things on the computer. And this is how um uh, r uh, operates it has a working directory which is you can see here i'm on mac os it's under slash user slash my nickname you said right um but you can actually establish a certain folder as your working directory like here and now if i run this command again it will show that i am now in the master plus directory under my home and uh we can um, um, create objects like that. This is an error. It looks like an error. It's actually formed by two characters. It's less than and the minus. Together, they form the so-called as, uh, uh, assignment operator. So this is where we assign the value of three to an object we are going to create in our working environment here that it looks like this, right? And it, it carries the, noun, the name scalar so we have created an object called scalar which has the value of three inside this is the command to list the objects in our environment like this we can see we only have one object here it's called scalar and we can save it on our hard drive i am now in my home and in in the folder master plus here and if i save that uh, i can see the data file here I call the, the data for our, our data, or if I have multiple objects, I can save the entire workspace and it, uh, it's another uh, object I have created on my, my data. Now, if I remove the object with the command remove, it's no longer here in my working directory. Uh, this is also, if you have multiple objects in the memory, this is also command to remove all your object. But if I load the data the, from the hard drive, I load that and I see the object that I had previously created, which I read from the from the hard drive on my computer, it has appeared again. So it's it's saved. Um, this is a numerical vector, and small c is the command to combine values into uh, into uh, uh, so-called vectors that can contain various things. Right? They can contain numbers, they can contain letters, they can contain logical values and so on. This is the one of the most basic things. Perhaps it's it's useful to say that um, um, R is 
uh, uh, case sensitive. So the command C is not the same thing as the command C, right? The capital letter C, it's a different command from the lower case letter C. But nevertheless, uh, this is how we create our vector. Um, there are various other commands to create vectors like that, like for instance, a string vector, and um, also a factor. A factor is the um, um, vector, f vector, like this, is the equivalent of categorical variables in uh, statistical analysis, right? They have categories, which in R they are called levels, right? And we see, let's say we have five people with categories of education, let's say A, B, and C, right? Um, there are also, uh, we can order the levels because by default they are, they are um, uh, taken in alphabetical order. If we decide for a certain ordering of the categories that uh, uh, we can see the ordering that we have chosen, first C, then A, then B. And, and more and more uh, objects are going to appear in our um, uh, working environment. And this is a matrix for which we can define um, a, a column names and, and row names like that. And this is also one of the most basic objects we are going to um, use in R. It's called a data frame. And the DF object like this, it looks like that. It has four variables, let's say, and, and four cases. And I can also define some case names with the same command row names. And I, I see the case. And this is one particularity of R compared to SPSS is that not only variable have names, in R rows have names as well, right? And uh, yeah, we can look at the structure of a particular variable inside the data frame is in the dollar side. So we refer to the column B from the object, DF object like that using the dollar sign. Now, let's quickly go to set operations in R. The negation is uh, uh, denoted with uh, exclamation sign like that. Oops, um, uh, I have pressed like this. So not true is false, right here. Not true is false. We can also combine logical values like this, and then we, if we negate the entire value, it reverts. So true becomes false, true becomes false, false becomes true, and then false becomes true as well. So it negates the entire vector at once. And the same kind of negation we have, this is set theoretical operation, the negation being the, uh, one of the most basic, like here, set operation, set negation, we have logical intersection, logical and, and logical or as the most basic operations that we are going to use, right? One minus, and then again, uh, instead of false, we, we say zero, instead of false, we say zero, and true, true is one, one. So we, we kind of tend to use zero for false and one for true. Now, if we have fuzzy values between zero and one, then the same kind, oops, the same kind of, oops, like this, the same kind of operation one minus we can, um, we can use here. And then it's inverted, right? Uh, by taking the fuzzy value and subtracting it for one, like one minus 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and 0 0.6 and 0 0.5, like that. And this is the negation. It's either in R with the negation dollar sign if we are looking for logical operators or in fuzzy sets, it's subtracting from one. Now, the logical and operation, uh, we have again a logical vector like here. We have true, true, false, false, and we can call it with the command all. Uh, and what I'm essentially asking here with the command all is I'm saying, are all the values inside this object true? And the answer is not true because only two of them are true and the other two are, are false, right? Now, by uh, taking the um, uh, square bracket here, I say only the first two values. Are all first two values true? And the answer is true again. Now, 
if we define another logical vector, we also have the AND sign, which is the intersection between two logical vectors, right? So let's see. Uh, C bind L vector and right vector. Like that, we have true, 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 false, false, true, and false, false. By taking the, the AND sign, we uh, take all of those values. So true and true is always true. True and false, the intersection between true and false is false. False and true is false. And false and false is false again. So only the intersection between true and true, the logical and, only that is true, right? And we can uh, see that by subsetting, like this is our DF object, data frame object. And we only have the cases where the variable A is urban and B is greater than 13. Like this. And we only have two cases, right? Uh, uh, which is uh, here, here. It's equal to, to the rural areas, sorry. Yeah, the rural areas, right? Um, we also have the command intersection, for instance, like this. So the intersection between these two sets of numbers, right? They intersect only for fuzzy sets. So those are logical operations. For, for fuzzy sets, if we define it like that, we have a command in package uh, QCA that is called fuzzy end. And the fuzzy end, so it's uh, taking the maximum value between any pair. The maximum between 0 0.7 and 0 0.2 is 0 0.7. Um, uh, 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 sorry, it takes it takes the minimum fuzzy end. Oh, be, uh, f uh, an end and one minus the, and the negation of this. Sorry, yeah, and the negation, yeah, the minimum between a and the negation of it here. Right. So the negation of one minus b that is zero point eight, and then the minimum between zero point seven and zero point eight is zero point seven. Of course, the minimum between 0 0.2 and 0 0.6 is 0 0.2, and the minimum between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 is 0 0.4, and this is how we take the minimum uh, uh, by intersecting. The other op logical operation is taking the union, the logical union using OR, and again, uh, we can call it the command any, any of the, oops, I have to run this first, and it's asking, is any of these values true? And the answer, of course, is true. And then we ha also have this uh, uh, pipe operator, like a vertical bar. And that also asks if that or, th or that is true, then we have true. That true or false, either of those is true, and the answer is true. False or true is true. And then we don't have any of the true here, and we have false. And this is how we do pipe operator in order to in order to uh, do it in R, like L vector, right vector, and then the union of those is all number from one, two, three, four, five, six, like this, right? Because we take the union, not the intersection. And then again, uh, we we can define uh, uh, set A, set B, and then we take the fuzzy or between the negation of A and the presence of B. And the negation of A is 0 0.3 here, and we will take the maximum of that, right? And then here, here, and then the maximum between 0 0.3 and 0 0.2 is 0 0.3. The maximum between the negation of 0 0.2 is 0 0.8. The maximum between 0 0.8 and 0 0.1 is 0 0.8, and so on and so forth, right? Or we can say stuff like that, compute A plus B, compute, or here, it's computing uh, the the scores for uh, 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 the fuzzy uh, uh, version of the Lipset data, which is embedded in the QC package. We'll talk more, more about that. Uh, we have a certain commands that we are going to use: compute, simplify, like this is here, um, or simplify that. And it's 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 looking at this uh, sum of products expression, and it's it's uh, calculating the simplest possible form 
that is equivalent of this long expression because uh, it has um, um, uh, got rid of many of the things there. Now, calibration is one of the most important things we are going to uh, uh, say because we need to take the data from its raw form, right? Um, like GDP per capita, it's in thousands of dollars, right? but we need to bring it into the computer under either trist sets or fuzzy sets. Right? And then we either say, for instance, the level of development on the, on the Lipset raw data. The Lipset raw data is like that. And we have development, the level of urbanicity, the level of literacy, the level of industrialization and the level of stability in the country. And that explains, for instance, the survival of democracy during the interwar period. Um, and that's a very known uh, uh, data set that is used basically in all uh, social science textbooks, uh, or many of the social science textbooks. And it's particularly interesting for us because we have countries for the rows and we have all these five um, um, columns that you, if you want to learn about it, then um, here is the kind of thing uh, you can do, question mark the object, and then we, you can see the explanation for all of those. Now, in order to calibrate, let's say in fuzzy sets, first thing to do is to exploit this variable. This and we will uh, obtain the distribution of points on a um, vertical axis like this. Um, and this is not very useful because some of the points are overlapping. So we will actually employ an argument called jitter. And we are going to uh, introduce a little bit of noise on the vertical axis, right? Now, uh, the question is which threshold so how can we divide all of those points in order to uh, make it either zero if it's low or one if it's high? And uh, this is a question of theoretical understanding, right? Uh, it says, well, the best threshold using cluster analysis, for instance, is about 626. Now, it happens that in the textbooks, they use the threshold of 550, and why? Because the 550 divided somewhere here, divided the countries that are uh, theoretically known to be not developed between those which are developed like that. Here, and then we have divided the countries between developed one and non-developed zero, right? Um, such a, a, a thing can be um, uh, done. For instance, if we run library QCA, this is another instance of R. And then there is a command run GUI, like here. Uh, it has a graphical user interface as well. Right? And then uh, we want to uh, see the data, uh, raw data for development, the, the exactly the same thing we can see here. And then um, if we use the menu calibrate, we take the level of development, we want crisp, right? Uh, let's jitter the points a little bit. And then we use 550, right? So all of the, all of the um, like Italy was back in the interwar period was uh, non-developed and then Czech Republic was developed. So this is how they used the, the threshold, but you can actually move this threshold left and right in order to divide. And then if you calibrate it into a new condition, let's say development recoding, we run it, we run this, and then we can see the data has another column with zeros and ones. So it's actually not only about commands uh, because our uh, my QCA package in R has a graphical user interface with uh, menus and dialogues, as you can see in this. Now, more uh, challenging is, for instance, the um, uh, multi-value. For instance, here, if I want two thresholds, let's say fine thresholds like this, and all the cases here will have a value of zero, all the cases here will have a value of one, and then all the cases here, we have a value of two, right? 
Now, in terms of calibration, so this is how we uh, this is how we uh, calibrate in order to get um, uh, from raw data like here 720 1080 to uh, uh, numbers like zeros and one. This is for crisp data, and we can also obtain fuzzy data as well. For instance, here data let's say fuzzy. You can see we we have all of the numbers being calibrated between zero and one. Right, and and this is how um, uh, we're we're going to get. So, in terms of uh, you, you can see here for fuzzy multi-value uh, uh, crisp, or in terms of um, uh, fuzzy data, there are uh, let's say two methods. I'm only going to look at one of them. Let's suppose, and this is an example from my book as well. Let's suppose we have heights of people. Right. Let's look at x plot height, like, like here, and then jitter is true. Now, these are centimeters, right? Uh, 160 is a short person, 190 or two meters is a very, very tall person. Now, again, uh, uh, calibration is extremely important and it's different from measurement. What we see here on this plot is measurement. We measured people's heights right? Like we measured the GDP of the country, right? But in QCA, we're not interested in average effects of the uh, GDP uh, on the level of development or, or, or on the welfare. We are interested in combinations of causes, like the level of development would be a cause for welfare. Right? The more developed the country is, the more welfare it will have, like in the correlational uh, language. And um, uh, uh, it, it, it turns out that there are many ways to calibrate this raw data. Like, like for instance, we have centimeters here. Because one thing is to uh, say, well, I want to know if, if, if people are tall, they are more likely to play basketball, right? Now, tall, this is the natural language, tall play, people play basketball, right? But what is a tall person, right? And we can think of that in terms of set theory. Now, uh, granted, a person having uh, one meter and 50 centimeters, 1.5, is not a very tall person, right? Whether a person with uh, uh, the height of uh, Two meters is a, is a whether it's a member of the tall persons, and we can we can have the set of tall people, or we can have the set of very tall people, and those are very different sets, right? Because a a person, let's say, with one point eight meters would have an inclusion in the set of tall people, let's say of 0 0.9. It's 90% included in the set of tall people, right? But in the set of very tall people, that will actually uh, not be as high. It will probably have a, a, a 0 0.6 inclusion in the set of very tall people. So in QC, it's very important how we define our concepts. Now, this is in terms of height, but in, in terms of development, let's say, one thing is to say developed countries are more likely to uh, demonstrate welfare. And another thing is to say, well, very developed countries are likely to demonstrate welfare. The two sets are different because we have um, defined them in different ways, right? Developed and very developed are different things. And this is how we calibrate the direct master by putting some thresholds. Like for instance, any person above 8.5 something uh, meters, they are uh, tall people. Any person below 1.65 meters, they are um, short people. And then let's say the middle like that. And then we have the inclusion, um, we have another in, in, uh, in decreasing order, for instance, right? Uh, this is the set of short people, right? And then let's plot this, okay? 
Uh, git plot. Did I plot? No. I think so. Uh, I went to the very far. Okay. I was about here somewhere. Okay, here. Okay, enter, enter, enter. Right. So this is the set of tall people. Uh, so we have centimeters here and inclusions between zero and one here. And the set of short people, so a, a person weighing two meters, it, it certainly has a score of zero in the set of short people. Like here, it will certainly have a score of one in the set of tall people. So this is decreasing. And this is the example by Ragin, where the national income per capita, we calibrate it saying that any country over 20,000 US dollars is developed, and then uh, any country below 200 500 is undeveloped, and let's say the crossover is somewhere between the, the point of maximum ambiguity is uh, uh, around $5,000, and then we plot it. And this is how it looks like in Ruggins' book, uh, the calibration of uh, GDP or income per country. So this is how this is how we obtain, like for instance, uh, from raw data. We also have uh, the crisp version of the data, only zeros and ones, or we can have the fuzzy data with scores between zero and one, uh, thanks to the calibration method there. And then uh, most of these cases will overlap. They will most of them will combine will will display the same properties especially for instance in the in the crisp data so for instance here you see these two countries belgium and Czech republic they are almost similar they are actually exactly similar so they they belong to exactly in the same category in the truth table procedure like for instance here analyze truth table and then let's say we have the crisp data we want survival of the outcome um we're going to assign it uh into an object and we are going to use a cut off of 0 0.8 for the inclusion sort by inclusion and run and this is ttlc here and you see uh let's say i want to show the cases again ttlc so you see uh, we said, what well, the Belgium and Czech Republic. So Belgium and Czech Republic actually belong to exactly the same category of all present conditions like that. And it turns out also Netherlands and UK have the same. So Netherlands here, here also belong to the same category, you see? And UK probably here, it's also belong to the same category. So it shows me all possible, all possible combinations of positive from all of the all of the um, um, uh, cases that I am studying, and it arranges them in the unique combinations of zeros and ones, like there. And the same goes, the same goes with the fuzzy uh, version of the um, of the Lipset data that we can see here. The fuzzy version. It has a similar procedure. We we take survival. We uh, also uh, put it on uh, zero point eight. And um, let's say we assign it to uh, a truth table for the fuzzy, run it, and then look at it. And this is how it looks. Again, Belgium, Czech Republic, Netherlands, and UK, they all belong to the same category. Uh, and then we have two combinations, two, uh, two uh, truth table combinations that for which the data uh, uh, shows a, a positive value for the outcome and then the rest of them are negative. We can also say complete data and we can see for instance here that for some of combinations, many of the combinations, possible combinations of development uh, uh, level or urbanicity, literacy, uh, industrialization, and stability, we do not have any data. And this is a very common uh, thing in uh, QCA, 
because it's, it's called the phenomenon of limited diversity. Social reality is very limited in its diversity. I'm sorry? Um, could you could you perhaps could you perhaps write down your your question in the yes. chat? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I will. Yeah. Yeah. Now I will. I will look at it. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 can barely, I can barely hear what you are saying, but if you, if you are able to write down your question in the chat, then... And it's probably not not related to our. Uh, it's probably not related to our uh, webinar. Okay, let me just uh, send her a message. Maybe she would be able to understand. Okay. It's coming from Gulamoya. Yes. Oh. Hello, Gulia, are you there? We are unable to understand whatever you are asking me, uh, asking sir. Reason there is a lot of disturbance in the voice. Can you kindly type your question in the chat box? Kindly type yeah. out in the chat box. Probably you need to mute uh, the person, uh, Ramani, because you are the um, organizer. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ah, I have removed her, oh. so let her uh, let us continue. Okay, okay. So social reality is uh, limited in its diversity, so most of the cases will cluster in a very limited combinations of causes. And then the rest of them will be unobserved. Some of the causes, the outcome does not happen. And for some cases, the outcome happens. And this is the truth table procedures. And once we have this truth table, we can proceed to the minimization of, of this procedure using the minimization here. And uh, we are going to use, let's say, the fuzzy version of the truth table. And then we have multiple types of solutions. We have uh, the so-called conservative solution that only analyzes the positive cases there. We can run it. And this is the conservative solution. This is basically because we only have two combinations of one here, then, um, uh, and the rest of them are unobserved, like here, question mark. The, the solution is that. Another solution, and this is the, the, the term for, for sufficiency there, Another uh, way is to include all of the cases which do not display any kind of data as if they were observed with a value of one, and then use all of those cases to further minimize this equation here. And then if we run that, we, we, we see that the solution is uh, more simple this time. So the combination of development and non digitalization or the combination of uh, uh, countries with or high urban areas and stable governments, they will lead to the survival of democracy. And this is the so-called parsimonious. This is the complex solution or the conservative one. This is the parsimonious solution, right? And then there is the intermediate solution, right, where we define some directional expectations, like here. 
Um, and the directional expectations, let's say, we say, um, I'm, I'm thinking that on the development and uh, presence of urbanicity, or let's say, uh, not industrialization, literacy, uh, not, not industrialization, um, and then a stable governments. All of that are theoretical expectations, directional expectations for which we can minimize that. And then, oops, yeah, like that, right? So you see now the, the intermediate solution is something in between the complex and the conservative and the parsimonious. Or I can say uh, industrialized, run it again, <clears throat> and depending on our theoretical expectations, you see the, the intermediate solution uh, can be more or less changed. In this case, it doesn't matter. Or if I do not have any kind of theoretical expectation about industrialization, I simply remove it off the table. And then I run it, and I get exactly the same thing. <clears throat> okay. And um, uh, we can assign that, we can show more details, run it, and we can see some more figures for the inclusion, for the coverage. All of that is uh, uh, duly explained in the book in terms of necessity and sufficiency. So these are combinations of causes, like for instance, uh, let's say we um, do not have any theoretical expectations and run it, and we have uh, the combination of development and non industrialization of urbanicity and stability. And we have inclusion in the set of uh, uh, survival of democracy and coverage, which means what is the unique explanation of this particular uh, of this particular solution model to the entire um, uh, parsimonial solution. And this is basically how you would take raw data, calibrate it, run it through uh, the truth table procedure, and then take the truth table and, and run the minimization algorithm in order to arrive at a minimal combination of causes that explain a certain social phenomenon. And I'm going to stop the presentation here. I could talk for days about this, um, but um, I think it's uh, probably a good time now for a Q and A session. Thank you, um, Edi, for such a lovely presentation. And somebody who is really interested to uh, know about the qualitative uh, comparative analysis is able to understand um, as to what exactly is uh, taking place over here, number one. Number two, how we are going step by step, like crispy, fuzziness that you have showed us, the beautiful visualizations. <clears throat> you know, because I uh, myself uh, keep working on it, so I really enjoy it. So, uh, first of all, I would like to ask uh, those participants who are here. If you have certain questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask AD directly. Uh, in case none of you ask me, I have a lot of questions and I don't want to lose this opportunity. So, I would be asking them. Yes. Kanan, you're most welcome. Yes, I'm waiting uh, for one to two minutes for some of you to raise the questions. Please don't feel shy. This is the opportunity. He's a master himself for the qualitative comparative analysis. So please feel free and you can ask him any question, uh, you know, right from the beginning till the time he has closed it completely with the uh, quotes. So you can ask him whatever you want to ask. Eddie, I think I will take the initiative to ask you. Okay. Now, uh, first and foremost, uh, when I saw all the quotes, uh, especially from the art package uh, that comes in the form of the quotes, where you have explained it so well as you have been doing it right now. And I see that there is so much uh, with the analysis and the entire methodology that we are talking about here is focusing on the numbers. 
right? Yes, the calibration. Yes. And I have um, understood that it is equivalent to measurement when we talk about the quantitative research. My question to you is, why is it that we have more focused on the word qualitative rather than a combination of both qualitative and quantitative? I hope I'm making it clear to you because when I started reading it, I saw that, yes, there is a lot of things which are present. Mm -hmm. You see, from the qualitative side, is it just because we have got the set theory and uh, truth tables in it, or is it the Boolean operators? Uh, let me make it in that manner. I want that uh, as a clarification, number one. OK, so the the Boolean uh, analysis is what, it, what makes it um, it what makes it possible to feed the data into a computer algorithm. Mm -hmm. And it what makes it possible to put some data there and then to let the computer do all the hard work of the minimization. But the procedure is, is let's say, extremely qualitative. And why do I say that? Because for the calibration purposes, um, that is very different from the measurement, OK? Let's let's take another example. Uh, mm -hmm. Computer can compare uh, countries in terms of the GDP. One country has a higher GDP than another, or uh, higher than the average GDP of all of the world, and so on and so forth. So the computer can arrange cases in terms of uh, the intensity of the raw numbers of the GDP. Uh, but for instance, when we define the concept coal. In the computer, we can put uh, 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 Celsius degrees, but the computer cannot tell us what is cold and what is hot, right? Uh, the span of Celsius degrees is enormous. We have minus 256 in the outer space, and we have potentially millions of uh, Celsius degrees in the hot sun. Uh, but for us, the span between hot and cold is very limited between zero and, and let's say, uh, 50 degrees. For humans, uh, 35, 40 degrees, 45 degrees is already very hot. But the computer does not know what is hot. We define what is hot in a very qualitative uh, way so that we can put a threshold at, at 40 degrees that is very hot for us, for the humans. And we can put the threshold at five degrees, which is, the, let's say, a, anything below five degrees is cold, right? Anything above four degrees is very hot. And then we can we have a very um, uh, short span that we define as humans, not the computer, through the average. What is hot and what is cold? What is tall and what is short? What is developed and what is undeveloped? These are theoretical concepts that allow the researcher to qualitatively establish a certain threshold that would uh, arrange the objects inside as hot, cold, developed, undeveloped, and so on and so forth. And then another nature of the QCA towards the qualitative, despite using numbers, like fuzzy numbers, like between zero and one, is that we are comparing, we are, before doing the actual minimization analysis, we are doing case studies. We, are, we do not take random samples of countries and then look in the correlation of the U. Rather, if we want to explain what combinations of causes makes countries rich, then we ought to compare not random samples of countries. That is the quantitative way. We ought to compare rich countries and poor countries, right? And then by different, by making the qualitative difference of the causes in each set of countries, we will arrive at a minimal combination of causes that explains the uh, a country being rich or uh, developed or undeveloped. Let's say you see, and that is a quality because array uh, in, in in selecting countries as, as uh, rich or poor, we are doing a qualitative case study analysis, not a random sample like in the quantitative uh, analysis. So that's the explanation. I'm not sure if I was able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
So this, despite you. using numbers, it's a qualitative analysis in essence. Okay, fine. Thank you, Eddie. Now there is another question which has come up from Kanan, sir. He says, kindly throw some light on sufficiency and necessity in okay. UCA, using R. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen once again. And I'm going to open the book here. And we have the analysis of necessity and, and, and sufficiency at chapters five and six. Now, this is, this is how uh, necessity is defined. Like, uh, um, uh, is the, necessity is the inverse of sufficiency. And in terms of Boolean um, Venn diagrams, it's a subset relation of the outcome in the uh, causal condition. So X, let's say, is the, is the cause and Y is the outcome. Whenever the outcome is a subset of the condition, we say the condition is necessary for the outcome. And then there are the definitions of a necessity. So X, the cause, is necessary for the outcome if X is always present when, when Y occurs. So there are situations, of course, when X is present and Y is absent, like here. Uh, in, in this circle, which is inside X, they're all of the situation when both X and Y are present, like here. But we, we see here that the circle Y is completely included in the circle X, which means every time Y happens, X is always present. There is no situation was when Y is uh, present and X, it doesn't happen. Because all of the cases when Y is present, it's, also, it's completely included in X. Now, in terms of sufficiency is the other kind of thing there. Sufficiency here, here. Uh, and that, that has the other sign here where X is completely included in Y. So the definition of the sufficiency, and we also have uh, bivariate uh, tables or um, uh, a fuzzy uh, tape of plots like that. X is a sufficient condition for Y when every time X is present, Y is also present, like this. So every time X is present, Y is also present. And this is how we define um, um, uh, sufficiency, right? In terms of graphical user interface, we have plots like this, X, Y plot. And let's say we say fuzzy development and survival like this, right? Uh, sufficiency in, in, um, in um, uh, fuzzy sets, it's, it's a matter of points being above the, the diagonal here. So if all of the points would be above the diagonal, we would have perfect sufficiency. Now, most of the points we can jitter, I think, uh, jitter points, right? Something like that. Most of the points are above, but there are some of the points below the diagonal. If they are slightly below the diagonal, there is no problem at all, like this and this. But uh, even that is not entirely problematic. And remember, this is the time between the two world wars, interwar period. Uh, the only problematic cases are those two here which display a very, very low uh, uh, level of survival of democracy, and yet they are very developed. And that contradicts the sufficiency in some respects. And that explains why, for instance, compute uh, development as sufficient for survival, data equals uh, Lipset fuzzy, oops, unknown conditions in the expression, I should have probably quoted. Uh, okay, let me take this. Compute development. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, development uh, sufficient for survival data equals FF. Unknown conditions expression. What in the world is happening? Okay, I'll, I will have to see. So, POF parameters of fit for the same thing. 
Oh, right, it's, it's the POF command, not the computer. Of course, of course, yeah. It's the parameter of it that gives us necessity and, um, and uh, um, uh, sufficiency. So we see we have uh, an inclusion in the, in the sufficiency of only 0 0.775, right? That is because of these points over here, which are situated below. If all of the points were situated above the main diagonal, then the inclusion for sufficiency would be close to one, like perfect sufficiency, something like that. And uh, the, for the necessity, we just use the other side like that. And we see development is a very necessary condition for the survival of democracy because it, it has an inclusion in the necessity of 0 0.831, like that. And uh, you can play with the negation of X, negation of Y, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is how we would do necessity and, and sufficiency. I saw another um, uh, chat question in terms of liquid scale responses. Yes. Yeah, they could in principle be reduced to fuzzy sets, but I would not recommend that. And there is a uh, chapter, a, a section in chapter four, which is um, on, on calibration, on how to calibrate categorical data, especially uh, regarding the digit type scales, right? It's, uh, it, it, it is a procedure, right? There is a procedure there uh, called uh, totally fuzzy and, and uh, uh, I'm not sure, um, totally fuzzy and, and I'm, I don't remember. Who, who Partial fuzzy is also right, there. Exactly, yeah. Right? Right. And there, now, there, is, there is this technique, but I would not recommend it for a single, liquid variable and why is that and this goes back to the social science methodology when when we employ a certain uh, research instrument we usually have a concept okay and then we do the so-called um operationalization of the concept. So the, the concept is something abstract that we cannot see directly, like the altruism, right? Altruism, we, 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 we cannot say by looking at the person whether it's altruist or not altruist, but we operationalize this concept in dimensions. And each dimension then um, can be uh, in, in the items, right? And we obtain multiple items E1 and so on and so forth. And then each item has a response scale in the Likert category, right? Uh, but we have many items. Uh, we cannot reduce the concept to a single item in the Likert scale. And that's just not possible. What we are dealing is with, with concept, not with items. Likert type response scale are referred to items, but we merely want to measure uh, concepts. Right. Thank you, Eddie. And now he has one more question. How to derive a truth table? With, with the command truth table, or uh, as I showed uh, in the graphical user interface, uh, using the um, menu truth table from the graphical user interface. Or there is the direct command uh, uh, called truth table, right? With capital T in the table. And um, there are many, many examples in the book on how to derive. Okay. Now, um, Eddie, uh, when I asked you, can I go ahead and ask you one more question? Yes, please. A yes. couple of questions, Eddie. Uh, you have showed us how to conduct a QCA very nicely, step by step, and how to proceed further. Then you have also told me why is it called QCA also in a very nice manner, because I understood that why it is called a QCA. When should I conduct a QCA in the entire timeline of the research? Like, for example, some say uh, you should start off with systematic literature review, then go ahead with meta-analysis, then bibliometric. Do you even um, recommend or suggest that, yes, you should do QCA at so-and-so level of the research methodology, the timeline I'm talking about, or what is it like uh, that is also one confusion which i always had with qca 
Well, uh, if, if you have individual level data, uh, like income, like age, like number of years of education, and so on and so forth, you might be better off to use the quantitative uh, statistical analysis because you have individual level data. There are efforts right now in the methodological world to adapt QCA to individual level data, but I'm, 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 not, I'm not that sure. QCA is, um, uh, at its core, is designed to work with the medium number of cases. Like, for instance, mm -hmm. a representative samples have thousands of individuals in the samples. QCA works best with like not more than 40, 50 cases, something like that. Uh, and that is because we ought to compare not individuals, which are many, many, many individuals in a population, but we ought to compare aggregate high level social units like countries. We do not have thousands of countries on earth to randomly sample. We only have a, a limited number of countries. And for instance, if we are interested to compare countries from the Eastern Europe, then the number of countries is even less. There are not more than 10 countries in the Eastern Europe, right? And then uh, we are comparing high level aggregated units. And, and this is why if your data is about comparing um, aggregated uh, units, then you should probably consider using QCA. If your data is individual level with measurements, then you should probably consider using statistics. And this is, well, there are many, many ways to uh, think about it, but otherwise it also has to a lot to do with your hypothesis. If your hypotheses are or can be derived with set theory, then you should consider employing QCA. If your hypothesis is about the correlation between variables, then you should consider using uh, uh, statistics. So it all depends on your hypothesis and your data. Okay, all right, fine. Thank you. Thanks a lot okay. um, about that answer also, because now I'm sure uh, when and, uh, you know, how to go ahead and take care. Okay. Now, one more question. Um, apart from our studio, right, where we, you have developed that particular art package and we are, uh, I mean, I'm very comfortable uh, in going ahead and completing with the analysis and all. Now, uh, I also have seen that, yes, you have shared another software here in the presentation, which is also called as QCA. Yeah, right? that, is that is included in the package. The graphical user okay. interface is included in the package. All right. So I haven't seen the latest one in that manner. So that. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, it's, it's been there. It's been there for many, many years. Since 2014. Okay. It's like it has like eight years. Uh, when when the the first I'm going to share the screen again. Okay. Okay. When you first open R and mm -hmm. load the package QCA, let's see here, library QCA. Um, okay, let me close this, open it again, load the package QCA. QCA. You will see a message here. And I say to run the graphical user interface, use the command run GUI. So I'm going to take this, run GUI, and this is how you open the graphical okay. user interface, right? So it's, in, it's embedded in the package. It's actually embedded in the package. Fine. You don't need, kind it's, not an, it's not another uh, thing. It's the same thing, just embedded in the package. Okay. Now, one more question that I wanted to ask you is that, uh, nowadays, even, um, you know, when I was reading um, about QCA, I have seen that now, uh, rather than, um, you know, just focusing on crispy or fuzzy set, uh, or even the calibration, nowadays, they have taken up uh, QCA to the higher levels also. Am I right? So if I want to publish a paper, okay, now, what do you suggest that I should uh, go ahead and use crispy and then talk a lot about it? And then in my next paper, talk about fuzzy 
then take a uh, go ahead with the calibration and then now i think uh, they are talking about even time qca also if i'm not wrong it is there in the package i have seen and some people are also talking about the evaluative qca also and they have come up with these things uh, in r so uh, you know what is the minimum requirement because most of the audience who are present right now the participants are basically the uh, phd scholars so even okay. if they are yes where should we go ahead with qca okay so uh, let me first point you to uh, this here Mm -hmm. um, logical minimization, theory evaluation, uh, additional information. Uh, where exactly did I put uh, assistance using mixed array here? So okay. one one of the it's the section seven from chapter seven in the truth thing. Mm -hmm. So one thing that many people did not properly understand is that. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to choose between crisp set and fuzzy set. You can have both in the same data. It's not necessary to have either crisp or either fuzzy, right? You can have certain variables as crisp, certain variables as fuzzy, and certain variables as, as multi, even the outcome can be multi-value like this, right? And still, the package is able to ingest, for instance, this variable is crisp, you have only zeros and ones. This variable, this condition is fuzzy, right? You have values between zero and one. This condition is multi-value because you have more than two crisp values, like zero, one, and two, and the outcome is also multi-value, mm -hmm. right? It's not a problem. We can use exactly the same common truth table, right? Because it, it automatically using, for instance, the uh, value two of the multivalue outcome to derive the to uh, define the presence of the other that and it will still create a truth table uh, 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 one thing that you probably immediately note is that the the truth table is always either binary or multivalue it's never fuzzy the fuzzy data is always always uh, reduced to crisp sets like this. Uh, so you have wrong numbers, never fuzzy. Only the these numbers are uh, um, uh, inclusion and, and PRI and stuff, they are, uh, have decimal state. But otherwise, the truth table, this one, is always about round, crisp numbers. Right? And you, uh, this is the procedure, how it's, how it's being calculated, the, the, the consistency and the inclusion for all kinds of things like here, you see, we can calculate inclusions in the absence of a crisp condition, absence of the fuzzy condition, and the absence or the value zero of the multi-value condition. And still it will uh, calculate the inclusion and coverage 0 0.862, as we can see it here, 0 0.862, right? So it's not necessary to uh, choose between crisp multi-value and fuzzy you can have all the combinations in the raw data like here and that's uh, section 7.7 in the latest version of the book and about the others um evaluative again you can have theory evaluation and in, um, in the chapter in the um, uh, contents we have theory evaluation here uh, more parameters of fit uh boolean expression something uh characterize more problems of it we uh, there is something about theory evaluation here where you can have um a certain command um it, 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 it's it's all in the book where you you can have the intersection between the theory and the solution and it will calculate all the parameters of it in order to test Actually, it's not like theory testing in the quantitative analysis, but it's doing the intersection between your theoretical expectations, theory evaluation here, is session 8.9 in the logical minimization here. And then you would have the intersection between theory, what you theorize, and the intermediate solution there, and you would have um, all, it, it's all, it's all covered in, in the book. 
And yes, there are many um, types of QCA. There are time series QCA, there are panel QCA. These are all very interesting developments, but the core of the QCA is the, it's, it's what I showed you today. Okay, now one more question. What are the advantages of QCA? Over, over what? Um, the, the advantage over, the over, over what, compared to what? Um, let's say the other methodologies that we have got for qualitative or quantitative. Okay, so over the qualitative, uh, uh, it's very clear that uh, you don't have to rely solely on your uh, uh, expertise in order to analyze data. Okay. You, of course, you, you do apply to your expertise when you calibrate the conditions. But once you finish the calibration, then anyone else using the same data will reach exactly the same logical minimization um, uh, by employing this algorithm in the computer. So that's one advantage that uh, uh, results are replicable if we apply exactly the same algorithm over the same input data. Mm -hmm. And over the quantitative is not necessarily an advantage. Each methodology has, um, let's say, a, 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 a certain situation where it's best and uh, another situation when you can't really employ. For instance, if I am comparing uh, five countries in Eastern Europe. I cannot really use statistics with five countries, but I can use QCA in order to compare all possible pairs of two countries in order to determine what combinations of causes um, uh, are responsible with producing a certain outcome. You see, so uh, and it also depends on your on your hypothesis. If the hypothesis is set theoretic, then uh, you can employ QCA. It's not an advantage of a quantitative statistics. It's just another type of making social science hypothesis. Like for instance, in, 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 in the quantitative statistics, you say, well, uh, an, uh, a higher level of education uh, has a, a positive effect of a, a higher level of income. Right? And that's the quantitative analysis, the correlation. Uh, in, in QCA, you would say, well, um, educated people, or very educated people are usually associated with a high, and those are very different uh, uh, hypotheses. You see, okay. and there is I one think. one more thing. One more thing in statistics, correlation is is uh, symmetric. Like for instance, uh, let me do this. Okay, and let me see here. So uh, a correlation is like a, a plot of points, right? And you have a regression line, right? And that is symmetric. The more x, the more y. The low, the, the less x, the low y. And that is symmetric, right? Whereas in in uh, QCA, reality actually is not symmetric uh, because the presence. The presence of the of the um, uh, causal condition is not always associated with the presence of the outcome, right? You can have situations like here, when you have high value of x and low value, like here, a low value of y, and this is high and this is low. And uh, for instance, uh, 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 in, in QCA, relations between causes and outcomes is not symmetric simply because explaining, explaining what combinations of factors are related to the presence of the outcome is not the same as the combinations of conditions which are responsible for the negation of the outcome. You see, um, uh, the absence of causes, they are also uh, can produce effects on the outcome. For instance, if you do not have a stable legal system, then a country will be anarchy, right? A stable legal system, the presence of the stable legal system guards against the anarchy. 
right? If you if you do not have that, the absence of the stable legal system, then you would produce the under. You would so the absence of causes do have something to do with the causes, and it's the same with the presence and absence of the outcomes. There are uh, certain recipes for the presence of the outcome and another recipe of causes for the absence of the outcome. And, so, and that is because the outcome of uh, the, uh, 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 a certain outcome is one thing and the absence of it is very, very diverse. It's like in the, in the cone like that right here. Very few things lead to success. Very few combinations of lead of things lead to success. And there are many, 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 many combinations that explains the absence of success. You see, it's like that. The absence is very heterogeneous. The presence is always homogeneous. And that's not, it's, it's, it's very different from the correlation. Okay. Right. And um, next question, are there any limitations to QCA? Well, yes, of course, the number of possible uh, causes that you can input, uh, it's usually rather small. Um, the number of cases, uh, and it's usually uh, medium, let's say, uh, small to medium. Uh, you can employ hundreds of cases, but then it wouldn't be QCA. It's not, it's not going to be qualitative. The Q in QCA assumes that the researcher has an intimate knowledge with each and every case included in the analysis, right? Because the cases are selected by the researcher, they are not randomly sampled. Right? In the quantitative analysis, the, the researchers is not supposed to know the cases because they are randomly sampled. In QCA, it is assumed that the researchers knows it has an intimate knowledge and, and, and has done previous research and case studies on every case, every single case included in the knowledge. The cases are purposefully selected precisely because in those cases the outcome happens and you want to explain why the outcome happens in that situation. So you do not randomly sample but actually select, purposefully select cases based on your knowledge, intimate knowledge with the cases. So it's natural that there are limitations because you, you cannot have intimate knowledge about thousands of cases. Right. Eddie, one more question. Since you have uh, discussed so much about the causal studies and you were also uh, you know emphasizing that, yes, you have to focus on the hypotheses that you have got in your study. So can I say uh, through this that, yes, uh, this is another way to um, quote unquote predictive, qualitative, comparative analysis also or no because you're making the predictions as you said that yes uh the outcomes through the qca would be a very yeah, strong but it's, one it's it's not a prediction it's it has to do with the regularity theory i mean okay uh, the causes that that appear regularly with the outcome mm -hmm. are the most associated mm -hmm. with the outcome right and that's the okay. regularity theory so it's it's actually the empirical data. It's not a prediction, but we actually use the empirical data we have collected in order to uh, employ the computer algorithm to uh, eliminate the irrelevant causes and mm -hmm. only preserve those causes which are definitely related to producing the output. But it's the empirical um, analysis of the data that gives us the solution is not a prediction it's what the data tells us about what is going on. okay right and a uh, quick question i mean i love asking questions because these are coming yes. up so maybe yes, i yes, take yes, up sure. another two yeah, or three please. questions and then i will uh, just keep mum um yes, yes one more thing that i was observing and looking out uh with the entire flow of the um, analysis seems to be a very rich. Do you think that, yes, I can uh, proceed further? Uh, just like uh, with systematic literature review, we go ahead with bibliometrics or meta-analysis. So uh, along with a quantitative, um, let's say, technique that I have chosen, can I take QCA also and uh, compare both the, of them together? Or you will say no remedy. Make it absolutely clear uh, QCA paper 
and no other methodology should be taken as a test through QCA. Because I have read one paper where the individual from the Department of Hospitality and Travel and Tourism, they uh, went ahead with the PLSEM, that is PLSM. And after that, to showcase that, yes, the results are such a good and authentic one, uh, they uh, did it another comparison through QCA. So do you think that's a viable methodology for us also to um, apply um, in our analysis? Or you will say no. Again, uh, it all depends on your hypothesis. If the hypothesis can be structured in terms of set theoretical expectations, then yes, QCA can be employed. If your hypotheses are correlational, then you would employ natural uh, uh, statistics. Uh, and I have been approached many times by people trying to employ QCA on different fields, on different data. And it's, it's rather difficult to adapt QCA to already um, uh, collected uh, quantitative data. Uh, okay. it, it, it can be done, uh, but it's not always possible. That is because the way you structure your research depends entirely on the way you structure your uh, research hypothesis, on your research questions. If those okay. questions are quantitative, then you will construct your research instrument so that the data you will collect is quantitative. If your hypotheses are set theoretic, then you will construct your research instrument, then you will collect the data in a way that will answer set theoretic questions. So it all depends on how you frame your research from the very beginning. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if you already framed it in the quantitative way, it's rather difficult to adapt to QCA and vice versa. Fine. Thank you, Eddie. Okay. I think uh, one of the uh, there are two participants who have raised okay. their hands. Kanan, uh, Kanan, sir, you can unmute yourself and you can please ask your question. Yeah. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, what is your recommended sample size for uh, about QCA uh, because uh, it has it is not a random sample and uh, and uh, analysis will take a long time if the number of samples are more. So what do you recommend to be a, a sample size for uh, QCA analysis? Well, it's 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 actually not a sample size. The sample size is only uh, meaning in, in statistics. In QCA, we do not have samples. We have okay. cases that are purposefully selected. So the more cases you uh, uh, are able to study in depth, of course, the, the better your analysis will be. But you have to have very in-depth knowledge about each and every case included in the analysis. And then there is a ratio between the number of conditions and the number of cases. Of course, if you have like seven causes as if you're in your hypothesis, you cannot really employ only five cases for seven causes. You would have to have a, a, at least like 25 cases or 30 cases for seven uh, possible uh, causes if your hypothesis has that many. And there are papers in the literature that uh, uh, help you to calculate the uh, optimal ratio between the number of uh, uh, cases and the number of uh, conditions. But otherwise, it's, it's not a sample. It's never a sample. It's purposefully selected cases. Thank you. Okay. Thank you a lot. Um, Deva, sir, uh, you can also unmute yourself and you can ask AD. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, AD. Uh, my question was, can we use this in a corporate kind of setting wherein we are trying to compare us, you know, uh, different sets of companies belonging to, say, different sectors? And if we can have a research idea which uh, where the hypothesis can uh, be framed suitably, as you rightly emphasized. Yeah, I believe so. And there are many articles in uh, the field of business administration. Uh, I see, I witness an explosion of interest in, in terms of business lately. And there are journals okay. dedicated to business, entire journals that, uh, like, for instance, Journal of Business Research has like 
many, many. Numerous I, articles. I lost the count. Yes, and numerous articles uh, employing QCA in, in business research, and not only business in op operations research as well, and tourism as well, where they uh, compare different uh, fields, like like you say, using not individual companies, although individual companies can be compared in, in certain respects, but actually, uh, uh, let's say, clusters of companies from, from uh, different fields that you can also compare. So yes, of course, the, it, the research can be framed for uh, domains like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. That okay. was very the, the point Thank is you. your, your research hypothesis has to be set theoretic. That's, that's the point. Fantastic. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, Adi, now with artificial intelligence around us, it has really surrounded uh, each one of us. What do you think, QCA and AI for future? Well, it's, they are kind of similar if you, if you start to think about it. And why is that? Because, for instance, machine learning. Machine learning is an AI technique, right? That uh, search it through millions and millions and millions of uh, pieces of data that we have available, mm -hmm. and they give you the most accurate correlations between the factors that would um, that would produce a certain outcome. And we have witnessed applications of machine learning, for instance, uh, into face recognitions and stuff, or even uh, uh, applications of artificial intelligence as you have witnessed in the uh, elections uh, of countries, they have used Facebook in order to point certain messages that are known to produce certain effects by analyzing, artificially analyzing millions and millions of data. And, and uh, if, well, of course, they are different in terms that machine learning and AI, they analyze millions of data, Whereas QCA is analyzing a very limited number of cases, right? Okay. But they are both they are both very alike in terms that they are analyzing empirical data in order to derive the best combination of causes that produce an effect. In in, in this way, they are very similar. Okay, fine. Thank you, uh, Eddie. I think I'm going to restrict myself with these questions. I really enjoyed uh, today uh, the session on QCA. Um, I have some more, uh, two minutes to go more. So if somebody would like to ask him another a couple of questions, maybe we can take up. Uh, Nisha is there, Mohammed Daud is there, Sri Krishna Dasa is there, uh, Devasar, Brijesh, you are also there. So in case, uh, you know, sir, these are all the nurtured individuals that we have. Okay, Kanan sir has raised his hand again. So sir, you can unmute yourself and you can ask him, Kanan sir. Yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, if we consider uh, QC as a part of mixed methodology, then can't we do uh, either the first stage of quantitative, uh, quantitative uh, study and then go in for QC, uh, QCA or uh, other way around? Uh, yet again, if your data is framed in such a way or is collected in such a way that it, that can be analyzed in terms of set theory, then there is no problem to employ set theory afterwards. But if your data is only uh, collected uh, for correlational analysis, then it would be difficult to uh, calibrate it in order to apply QCA. Th this is a very important question that you need to ask before collecting the data. You, you can collect data solely for quantitative analysis. You can collect data solely for QCA, or you can opt for collecting data that can be applied both in correlation analysis and QCA, depending on what kind of data you, uh, you manage to collect. But basically, if you think in terms of, of, of operational models of the concepts, then concepts, I think, can be translated into uh, numerical data for quantitative analysis and set theoretic questions in QCA. But that is uh, challenging, of course, uh, to, uh, to have the collected data that you can apply both QCA and quantitative analysis. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Edie.
I think that was a wonderful presentation, and uh, we had some good questions also from the participants who are present out here. So I really appreciate you giving us some of your valuable time today on a weekend, and especially looking at the time difference and everything. So thank you for joining us up again, and I'm sure uh, there are some more questions, and definitely from my side, your mail ID, I mean, your mails would be bombarded a little bit uh, in the sense no that problem, I'm not facing. So we will be sharing it again with you. And uh, hopefully one more uh, session with you at the advanced level of QCA in that case. Okay, okay so I'm uh, looking forward. Yes. Yeah, I could have I could have probably continued with my presentation, but I, I just I looked at my clock and because there is a half an hour difference uh, in, in between India and Romania, oh, okay. I thought I thought I talked for more than um, uh, I was allowed. So this is why I ended my, my talk so abruptly and opened okay. the, the, the so, floor. Yes, questions. you want to continue? You can. No, it's okay. it's, uh, it, 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 now it's okay because it's actually the questions and answers, which mm -hmm. is the most interesting because otherwise it's a monologue and less than a time. Okay. It's okay. Thank you, Adi, for joining us. And I will be so looking forward to Thank you all for participating. Yes. Indeed. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you to all the participants who joined me up today and uh, stayed till the end of the session. It's a good gesture uh, to be with a guest uh, speaker. And I hope uh, some of the questions that were raised out were helpful for each one of you also. So I would be sharing the details about my next masterclass lecture. And uh, that would be a very interesting one for each one of you, because this was something uh, that was totally different from my uh, qualitative, um, I should say, research. And now uh, I would be coming up with another masterclass uh, very soon, maybe hopefully uh, not this week, the coming week. And uh, you would be surprised who would be joining us up. And till then, thank you for joining me up. Take care, safe, health, and enjoy your Sunday also. Bye to all of you. Take care. Bye.